Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Each year we have a theme in the spring at North Idaho College and we have a week of speakers from all over the country dealing with uh, very important issues and it's called the North Idaho College Popcorn Forum and this year the topic is Hot Talk, Passionate Debate for New Age. We've already brought you two programs and we're moving now into another sub-area of that uh, question and it's today and next week called Free Speech and Press versus Censorship. We're so pleased to have on our program today a very distinguished guest from Seattle. Our, our guest is Gary Mahara. He is an attorney uh, for Safeco Insurance Corporation and has been there since 1985, where he has served as a litigation attorney, corporate legal attorney, and contract attorney. He has served as an assistant director of human resources at that corporation since November 2004. Our distinguished guest is also presently serving as first vice president of the King County Bar Association. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree in administrative justice from Portland State University and a doctor of jurisprudence from Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College uh, in, uh, received in 1983. Uh, Gary, you gave a wonderful speech here today and, and you were on the podium with um, uh, Professor James Vache from Gonzaga and uh, and took somewhat different viewpoints between the two of you. And welcome to the program. We're delighted to have you here and look forward to the questions. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. It was a very interesting experience this morning during the debate. Well, you, uh, very lively and uh, very good audience participation. Well, you're just great to, that you would do this for us. And we welcome our panel, uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is director of public relations at North Idaho College. And the first question will come from uh, Janelle Burke. Gary, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and I know our audience is going to be very interested in listening to what you have to say. Can you please, just to set the foundation for our discussion today, tell us what is the First Amendment as it applies to free speech, and then secondly, detail a couple of the important principles with regard to that particular amendment, those principles, legal principles that have been developed over time. All right. Well, a little bit, before we get started, I, I do need to uh, uh, say that I am not a constitutional law attorney. Uh, my, my practice has been in an, uh, insurance defense and litigation, and I'm currently doing human resources. I, uh, in a weak moment, uh, a friend in, in the HR department at Safeco, Josh Buhner, asked if I would uh, be willing to uh, address uh, and uh, the topic of uh, First Amendment censorship and free speech. And so uh, I had to do some research and some reading and, and uh, become proficient. And it's a very, very interesting topic. And uh, it was a very educational experience for me. The First Amendment is not found in the Constitution uh, of 1776. It's not found in uh, the, I'm sorry, in the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, and it's not in the uh, um, Constitution either. It wasn't until 1791 that the framers, uh, because of outcry from the citizens who wanted their uh, certain guarantees of freedom written down, that the uh, framers wrote the first ten amendments to the Constitution. The uh, free speech, freedom of speech and press, is contained in the First Amendment. So. I guess you might consider that as, as one of the most important. Let me read to you uh, what the First Amendment actually does provide. It's a blueprint for personal freedoms. There are only 45 words. It's not a long, not, not a long quote. The First Amendment provides, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So in essence, for our purposes today, the uh, First Amendment, when it applies to uh, the uh, speech and press, is really saying, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or press. And as I said this morning during our debate, 
nowhere is there a guarantee that all speech is, is uh, protected speech. And so what we have uh, seen, the courts, most especially in the last 50 years, uh, is to interpret what the framers of the uh, uh, Bill of Rights really meant by freedom of speech and press. And so we have um, a smattering, and we can get into that uh, a little later, of interpretation and application of what does freedom of speech and press really mean. Is it just the oral words? The courts have said no. It's not just the spoken words, but it also includes the written words. It also includes conduct. And so uh, the government but uh, ha has, uh, through the courts, has taken a stance on, on, the, on the issue of First Amendment. Thank you. All right, Reinhardt. I just want to follow up with, you just touched on what I was going to ask you, so maybe we could expand on that. Gary, what, what exactly does the First Amendment talk about in terms of it's more than just the spoken word when we're talking in today's age? Could you give us kind of more of a, um, um, an explanation of what it does um, cover? As I said, the Supreme <coughs> Court and the other uh, federal courts have looked to the interpretation of what does freedom of speech and what does freedom of press really mean. And so uh, issues, uh, for example, uh, flag burning, the internet, uh, are all very, very hot topics and, and continue to, uh, and child pornography, obscenity laws, those fall within uh, the protection or no protection of free speech. So. Uh, in the past 50 years, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has, has, uh, has pretty much uh, set us on a course of, of experimenting of, of what does the First Amendment really provide. And so in the United States, Americans do have the right to the following. And I'll just, if I can re read them, because it is a rather lengthy test, a list. Uh, Americans have the right to desecrate the national flag as a symbol of protest. If it, if, but the condition is, is that if it's their own flag. Uh, the courts have, have looked at cross burning, and, and Americans can burn a cross as an expression of racial bigotry and hatred if it's on their property. Uh, Americans can espouse the violent overthrow of the government as long as it is mere abstract advocacy and not an immediate incitement to violence. What the Supreme Court did in, in the Brandenburg Court case was to enumerate a, a, a test, uh, and the court said if it is imminent lawless action, in other words, if it's immediate uh, and, the, and the danger to safety and health uh, is, is imminent, that is not protected speech. So it's not, so they've action, conduct, not verbal words. Uh, it, it, it's, it's now been expanded to, cover, uh, to be covered under the First Amendment protections. Traffic in sexually explicit erotica, as long as it does not meet a rigorous definition of hardcore obscenity. In that case, the, the court in 1973, in the Miller case, tried to enumerate a three-prong standard of what obscenity is. And uh, uh, one of the justices uh, was, wasn't trying to be funny when he wrote, um, I know it when I see it. <laughs> and it, the, the problem with obscenity is it's very difficult to define. And so the three-pronged test in Miller um, set forth uh, subjective standards. So uh, obscenity is based on what a community's value is. is uh, and so we, it, the folks in Coeur d'Alene and, and that community and their values on, on obscenity may differ from what is acceptable uh, and, and deemed obscenity in San Francisco, New York, or Chicago. And so it's based on what the, the community value is uh, to define obscenity, and then it must have no, uh, absolutely no literary uh, artistic uh, value whatsoever. Uh, defamation of public officials and uh, public figures uh, is okay as long as it's not knowingly uh, or recklessly uh, uh, stated. Uh, Americans can disseminate information invading personal privacy if, as long as it's deemed newsworthy. And that's how we have the tabloids in the supermarkets because it's deemed to be newsworthy items. Um, 
<clears throat> and, and so that's how, those are some of the topics that the courts have addressed as, as falling within the purview of uh, uh, First Amendment free speech and free press. I want to say before I give my question that you're here representing yourself, not Safeco Corporation, because you were asked to come speak on this issue, but not on behalf that, of the company. That's a good reminder, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I want to make that clear. This morning it was just fascinating when you and Professor Jim Vachet discussed this very, very important question, and he's a law professor at Gonzaga University. He'll be on the program next week. And you have areas, of course, where you do agree, but there are areas where you, you have marked disagreement. Would you uh, respond to what uh, many scholars have said in the field, uh, going all the way to the purists who say in the First Amendment it says Congress shall make no law. It can't have any law at all in relation to uh, censorship on speech and press. To those who say, well, there can be a very uh, a limited area, and I think uh, he's speaking for himself, but Professor Vachet thinks that the area is very extensive of free speech and press. He didn't indicate that you know, it's absolute, but that it's very extensive. And you draw a line a little bit um, further into, into a more restrictive area. Could you, based upon your presentation this morning with him, could you give us a few examples of where you would be more supportive of not uh, protecting some speech and press under the First Amendment, that those who are more, uh, I guess I would say liberal in their interpretation of the extension of, of those uh, free speech and <coughs> press protections, I just uh, some kind of examples where you would be disagreeing, like with Professor Vachet. Well, I take the position that censorship is an absolute necessity in a civilized society. And the reason is, is that we do need to have some restraints, some restrictions on, on what is appropriate and, uh, and, 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 and right. Um, as I said to the group this morning, when I was in, in college in the, in the uh, 19, early 1970s, uh, I considered myself a very liberal individual. However, in the 1980s, when, when we started having children, my view of the world changed dra drastically. And uh, what I considered to be fine and, and, and morally okay was no longer the case because now I had children whose welfare I needed to really consider. Now the internet has, has really drastically changed all of that for for those of us with kids and, and parents. Um, it's so easy for kids to get onto the internet and go to websites that are totally inappropriate, morally objectionable, uh, and so some controls do need uh, to be in place. And so I, that is why I do advocate uh, some uh, reasonable restrictions and censorship. So in addition to the internet, um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, television and radio. And of course, uh, there are certain stations that are just coming to the home uh, automatically, the major networks. But there's also stations where you can't get them unless you purchase them. And so that, there, there's a screening there. Would you be in an agreement with some of the decisions lately of the FCC that they've levied rather heavy fines against some of the major television networks for what they think are inappropriate comments or uh, statements on television and radio. Yes, I would agree with with uh, the restrictions. Uh, you know, the, when the framers uh, adopted the the First Amendment and uh, in the Bill of Rights, they certainly had no idea where uh, music was was going to end up. And so we today we have the likes of Eminem and Ice T and and uh, Marilyn Manson, whose whose lyrics and music are. are are very objectionable to the to the per, uh, average uh, person in a, in, a, in any community, um, and so the the lyrics which are objectionable, if they're allowed to to be projected across the the radio stations and on television, uh, the the average person who just happens to be turning in on the radio would be subjected and and bombarded with with those objectionable uh, words and lyrics. My son, who's a teenager, uh, subjects me to, to some of that music in the car. And, and I have to, you know, quite frankly, I have to tell him, okay, that's enough. Change the channel. Because I, I, I'm shocked at some of the, uh, the lyrics and, and, and uh, words that are, are in some of the uh, heavy rap. And, uh, so it'd be interesting to see someday when he has children if he changes his view some <laughs> after. The, when he I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I suspect he will. <laughs> Janelle Burke. <clears throat>
My question will go to how much speech is protected by the amendment. In other words, what can we do? Can we yell fire in the crowded theater? That's the sort of underlying question. But how much speech is protected? How, how inflammatory can you be out there? Well, you, you know, there, the courts through the years have, have uh, prescribed and, and permitted certain uh, conduct and speech. Yelling fire in a crowded theater would not be appropriate because of, of safety reasons. Um, uh, obs yelling obscenities in the middle of the night on a bullhorn would also not be appropriate. Um, so it would be, you know, it's a case by case and, and what is reasonable? What's a reasonable restriction um, that, the, that the government can impose? Now, as I, I mentioned to the group the, this, after, the, this morning, uh, it's not just the government. Uh, censorship has, has been around for, for centuries. Ancient civilizations, uh, churches, had their own uh, censorship in place, uh, conduct, dress codes, uh, mores, taboos. They, those were all in place in ancient civilizations. Poets uh, were banished and, and uh, not allowed to write. Uh, in in uh, in ancient Roman Greece, uh, so it's nothing new in the in the uh, American phenomena. Just just a short follow up to that too. And is is this <coughs> limited to uh, the federal government, or can local governments also impose certain restrictions? Well, the First Amendment is is federal federal law, federal jurisdiction. So yeah, you know the court cases that fall within the jurisdiction of the uh, federal courts and the Supreme Court. Uh, but yes, the states can regulate. Uh, churches regulate quite frequently with with what uh, with their their uh, uh, mores and, and, and edicts. Uh, it, but more importantly, we as individuals we we self censor ourselves uh, of what is what is appropriate or what we deem as appropriate. And I think individuals are the are the biggest censors, uh, and we rely on on individual sensibilities to maintain. Uh, Censorship. Or Reinhardt. The slippery slope seems Very to much be so. <laughs> is definitely who determines what is objectionable. And I think um, if you study free speech, I think one of the arguments is that if we had censorship, then what happens to minority viewpoints? So could you explain your, your um, opinion on that? <coughs> well, freedom of speech does allow for the, the open debate. Um, but not certainly not if in, if it uh, endangers the the health welfare uh, of other individuals. So the f First Amendment does provide the ability to openly communicate, openly discuss, openly debate free ideas. So the minority opinions do have that opportunity. Uh, and and as I said to uh, Professor Vache this morning. If we had no censorship, if we had no restrictions on, on speech, what would your classroom look like? How would, you, how would you be able to conduct any higher education when you have minority opinions who are questioning the, the, uh, the professor's opinions, who question the, the uh, content of the material, who want to raise their opinions over everybody else's opinions? and there's nothing that can be done to restrict them other um, because they do have full freedom, absolute freedom uh, of speech that's guaranteed under the First Amendment. And I agree with you. I've had to sit in the car and listen to that rap music also, and it's not kind. <laughs> I think some of those things come with age. I think so. It's not good. Uh, Gary, I want to talk about I believe I'm correct. It's the only time I can recall in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, came down with this particular uh, theory, and, I, and I'll have a little background on this. In 1957, Roth versus United States, of course, they attempted with a seven-point rule to define obscenity, and among other things in that was that um, for material to be since had to be without re uh, utterly without redeeming social value, and it was a standard for the whole country when they when the courts judged it. Then the Miller case that you've mentioned in 1973. Uh, they came up with three amendments to the rule, and one of those was that you could use uh, your uh, contemporary community standards in your community. They also changed the redeeming social value to say that it has to have serious literary, artistic, and um, uh, historical value to not be censored. But here's my question. 
I think it's the only time I ever recall that the Constitution of the United States that changes depending on what you get in your automobile or not. That if you're in Coeur d'Alene, uh, you might have more restriction on what you can see and read. And if you drive down to San Francisco, you have more freedom. And so <laughs> I say to students all the time in relation to this, this is, this is quite confusing. Because if you go to another state, you have a right to attorneys like you do in your home state or, or you practice your religion, whatever. Uh, is for those who support more restrictive standards, uh, how does one explain to people that their constitutional right and the First Amendment will depend on what particular geographical location they're in or what transportation they take to another community? I guess that's, that's a sticky question, and I don't believe the court's ever done that on any other issue. Not, not that I know of either. And, and that's, ex that's the point uh, made earlier, that it is a very slippery slope. You know, we have to rely on, on the various community standards. And so what the federal, what the courts are saying is that let's let the communities gauge what is uh, morally objectionable uh, and, and what, they, what is deemed uh, to be, um, uh, or what should be censored um, as obscenity. Um, and so, yeah, wherever you are, that's the standard, the community standard that, that would prevail. That's interesting. There's a little backup on that. Uh, I think I've got my numbers correct. Between 1957 and today, uh, they've heard over 100 cases on this issue at the Supreme Court. It's only a subject that they, they seem to never be able to <laughs> settle it. I can think of nothing else that goes to the court 100 times. And um, what has also happened is interesting is that in some communities where they took the court seriously you know, and said, yeah, we get to decide our standards. And then when you decide your standards, the case goes back to the court. They say, well, your standards are not those. So. So I, I just make that commentary. It's just a really, it, it is a difficult question, isn't it? Um, but with that, I'll go to Janelle Bird. My next question will have to do with the press. And there are different standards depending on the person who is being reported upon. So can you please enlighten our viewers as to what some of those standards are? In other words, if you're a famous person, the standards are different than if you're not a famous person. Right. The, the seminal case of Sullivan versus the New York Times um, dealt with the public figure. And <clears throat> what the court uh, in 1964 uh, determined, um, what the case involved is uh, Sullivan was the police commissioner in Montgomery, Alabama. And as I recall, uh, information uh, during the, the uh, protests, uh, uh, but no names were used, and some of the facts were, were not correct. Sullivan sued. He got a 500,000 civil uh, judgment uh, in his favor. Uh, the New York Times appealed, and uh, what the court in, in the Sullivan case uh, uh, came to s pronounce is that when it comes to public figures, um, you can make statements. But and if it's de later determined that they were false or incorrect, there is <clears throat> uh, a, a, the condition is that uh, the person who published must um, have known of the falsity or wrote it in reckless disregard for the truth or falsity. So in other words, for public figures, there's a different standard um, for than private individuals. Now the tabloids uh, uh, get away with, with uh, the stars and then the photos and, and all the unkind uh, stories because it's deemed newsworthy, though they are public figures. Uh, so we do have different standards for public figures uh, and, and uh, entertainers as opposed to individuals. And so individuals would have much more protection than the public figure. Yes. Basically. I yes. mean, that, that's where the to bottom line. To meet the line. standard of, uh, well, you get into the, the, what is defamation, libel and slander, and that's a different, uh, different issue. <laughs> Gary, can you share with our viewers some of the issues that um, surround the First Amendment and the Internet? Because the Internet is such a new medium and seems to have some of its own um, logistics. Can you explain how? I was intrigued this morning when someone said that, well, the Internet is not a, just a, an American medium. So how do, how do these, um, how does the First Amendment apply to the Internet? 
That's that's a very difficult issue to tackle because it is the the worldwide net. Information is is moving so rapidly. Um, uh, technology moves and develops so quickly. Um, information travels across the internet from around the world, <clears throat> so it is not limited to to just the United States. It's it it's impossible to keep information out of uh, coming into the United States. Um, we have uh, internet filters, um, but as technology gets better, you know the uh, uh, websites can can break through. Um, so even even the internet filters are not a hundred percent foolproof. And so you know you can make pronouncements of uh, kitty kitty pornography is an absolute um, um, prohibited um, um, medium. Um, but other than that, you know, the music, the lyrics, that's all available. Uh, it would, it, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's going to be nearly impossible to uh, restrict and censor uh, on the Internet. It's just way too big. We're getting close to being out of time, but I want to follow up on Ernest's question, and that is, uh, you know, there's that, that talk show host, and um, I guess he does both, I don't know, but radio and television in New York Stern, and <coughs> he's quite controversial, to say the least. Uh, but he went off of some of the major networks where they could be uh, fined by FCC and, and, and he's on a, on a satellite system, whatever. So both in relation to the Internet and, um, and moving even beyond the United States. So in dealing with your position on, on some control, uh, it's going to be more difficult with this new technology, isn't it? Oh, yes, very much so. So even though in the United <clears throat> States there may be certain regulations, FCC, if you go to some independent satellites in other countries, or the internet is the, the genie out of the bottle. I think so. I mean, you know, the, the the government has, or the, the you know, the FCC has tried to say, well, you know, you can you can televise certain things, but you have to do it out of prime uh, prime time television and uh, off of the mainstream television stations, and and so the, you know they try to set up the restrictions, and and you know, but even still, that's not that's not going to be an end all and and a solution. It just pushes it and, and uh, delays the ultimate decision. Gary Mahara, thank you so much. We're out of time. You've been so gracious today with your time, and we appreciate you so much. And uh, you've added quality to our program at North Carolina College, and both in the popcorn form and the TV show. And good luck in your work. And uh, uh, we will be saying uh, to your other people in Seattle, thank you for what you've done. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll be with us again next week at the same time when we'll move on with this subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music